opportunities to get involved, some that we know, some that we don't know, and that is our, one of our goals is to help us understand what resources are around us, what's happening around us, because sometimes we don't even know all the things that God is doing. And the only way we know that is for us to be informed. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, would you just take these next few minutes, Lord, and all the things that we have experienced today, all the things that you have shared with us, the encounters we've had in your presence, Lord, the testimonies of your faithfulness, Lord, whether here, whether in Guatemala, whether in California, Lord, you are the same everywhere. So, Father, we thank you that the things that you are doing, you're going to continue to do, that your word is going out and your word will not come back to you void without accomplishing what you sent it out to do. So we commit our hearts to this afresh. Lord, resend us over and over and over again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Sonia, for sharing your heart, sharing and encouragement and blessing us. And that really is is been our mission of the last number of months is to get the frame of reference for what God is doing in our community. I mean, thank God for what he's doing around the world. Thank God for the testimonies. But what is God doing right here? Because this is where our hands and feet are. This is where we live. This is where we get involved. We don't just look at, but we get involved in. So blessing the city through the tongue of the righteous, the city is blessed. That we are blessing the city I mean, we could talk about all the bad things. We could talk about all the bad news. We could talk and complain about anything we wanted to. But how, much, how many of you know that we could turn the tide of this whole thing when we just start by being blessers? Being blessers. And Peter said in one of his letters, second letter, he said, you know, to write the same thing to you is not a bother for me. And it's a benefit to you. So no matter how many times we hear the message of the gospel to go, it's for our benefit because we can never hear it enough. We can never really understand the impact of it until we're going, 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 going on a regular basis. And I want to just continue to just dive into what God has called us to do, understanding that there are people in our circle, in our city, that have been hand-selected by God to encounter you, to encounter me. There are setups happening as we speak today, tomorrow morning, that God is setting us up. And the thing we have to be mindful of, and that's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom, then everything else will be added to us. If we're really honest, how much of our time is absorbed with us? Our days, our schedules, our problems. And some of it is just necessary. It's the way life is. I mean, you've got to be aware. You've got to take care of business. But how many of you know that it's so easy to get so wrapped up into that that we walk past people? We walk through situations. We hear things in one ear and goes right out the other ear, and then by the end of the week, we forget what we heard. So this is a time to become really mindful of what God is doing. So turn back. We were in this verse the past couple of weeks, but turn back to Matthew chapter, chapter 9. I want to take another look at Jesus' ministry. I'm just going to read this, and I want to dig a little bit deeper. Starting at verse 35, Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogue, synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Boy, that's a dangerous prayer. We're not praying for the harvest. We're not praying for revival. We're praying for God to send us into the harvest to create the revival. That's a whole different scenario. You know, Christians love to pray for revival, but sometimes the praying for revival is the expectation that if we pray long enough, God's going to do something. Now, God is sovereign, and he will do what he's going to do, and sometimes he has to bypass the ones who are supposed to do it in order to get it done. But to know and understand the call the prayer is, pray for the harvesters to be sent out. Not pray for the harvest. Pray for the harvesters. Jesus said the harvest is white. And what does that mean? That means it's ripe. And anybody who's a farmer knows that there's different times when foods and fruit are ripe. And what happens if you don't pick it when it's ripe? It rots. It dies on the vine. It becomes fertilizer for next year's crop. In the kingdom, there's always a white harvest somewhere. There's always. We have natural seasons. We have planting, 
we have watering, we have gardening, and then we have harvest. Well, there's seasons in the kingdom, but how many of you know that it's all the time? The book of Revelation says there's a river with trees on either side of the river that are for healing for the nations. And they bear fruit all year round. They're always bearing fruit. There's always some fruit somewhere. So we can look around us and we can get depressed about what's not happening, or we can look within us and say, Lord, send me out there to make something happen. Because it's not a matter of waiting for God. God's waiting for us. When Jesus said, go, he said, I'll be with you. So the indication is that he wants to do something. And if I don't go, then I'm holding him back from doing something. So Jesus was on a mission. And he went about all the region he was appointed to. Now, he wasn't appointed to Gentile territory. And he told his disciples, my ministry is to the house of Israel. My ministry. I was sent here first and foremost to minister to those who receive the word first. When I leave, it's going to be your responsibility to go to Judea, Samaria, and uttermost parts of the earth. He gave them a glimpse of it, but he said, my mission is here. Your mission is there. When he looked at the crowds that were following, remember, he was around the lake of, or the, the Sea of Galilee, which I saw last week was the center of commerce in that part of Judea. People came from all over the known Roman Empire to do trade and commerce around that, that lake. So it was a crossroads, if you will, of all different types of people. And it says that people were coming from as far away as far reaches of Syria, which could be as much as 300 miles away because of what they heard. So think about the power of testimonies. Your testimony may not seem significant to you, but it's significant to somebody who hears it who may tell somebody who needs to hear that who comes to find the same Jesus that you experienced. So don't ever sell short your testimony. It doesn't have to have all the fireworks, bells, and whistles. If God changed you, if God encountered you, if Jesus is real to you, then your testimony is real for somebody else. But Jesus looked at these masses of people coming from all over and says he looked at them and he felt compassion. The word compassion there means with passion or to be able to feel the same thing that other people are feeling. It's beyond empathy and it's beyond sympathy. Compassion is a force that compels you to do something about what you feel. Because a lot of times we have sympathy for people who are broken. Sympathy for people who are going through stuff. Sympathy for people who have loss or lack. Of. And then we can have empathy. Empathy is that you've experienced it yourself and you know what you're going through. Oh, I know what you're going through. You can be sympathetic, you can be empathetic and still be apathetic. right? You could be sympathetic, you could be empathetic, and still be apathetic. Jesus was sympathetic. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus is a sympathetic high priest. In other words, he can understand our weaknesses. He understands what we're going through. He understands we get into messes. He understands that things don't work out. He understands that. He's a sympathetic high priest, but he's also an identifying high priest in that he can empathize with us. Because he also says that he suffered or was tempted in the same way that we suffer and are tempted. So it's not only he can feel for us, he can feel what we feel. And that's so important in this day and age that people feel that religion, that Jesus, that Christianity is so detached from reality. You don't understand the suffering of people. You don't understand how hard it is to be this. You don't understand, you don't understand. And in some cases, they're absolutely right. Because we come from this high place thinking that we have to lower ourselves to a lower place. Well, Jesus lowered himself to the lowest of lowest places. Read Philippians chapter 2. He humbled himself, not only to become a human being, but to become a human being who served the lowest of the low, who was willing to go to the death for every person. Every person. He was willing to take on their pain and their suffering. But Jesus was more than sympathetic. He was more than empathetic. He felt compassion. And the word compassion there carries with it a push. A push to do something. And that's why it says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out. The Greek word is ekbalo. And ekbalo is best if you could think of a punter who gets the ball, takes the ball, drops it, and pew, drop kick. That's the word ekbalo, pushing out. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to push his church out. Because how many of you know we can become resistant? We can become apathetic. 
the word pathetic <laughs> is involved in that word. But the word pathetic comes from pathos, pathos, that you're thinking about something to the point where it becomes you. When you're, your pathos, when your thinking is so consumed with something, that's what you become. Jesus was the embodiment of the compassion of his Father. Our call is to be the compassion of Jesus to the world around us. In order to do that, we have to go beyond those two other pathies, sympathy and empathy, and get into compassion, where you actually act, where you wake up in the morning and your thought process, your pathos, begins to think about other things other than yourself, other people other than your own needs. When you are thinking about it, not just when you encounter it, because what happens if you're going about your day, you encounter the need and you don't realize that that's what you were supposed to do. And you go, oh, I should have. Anybody ever have those moments? Oh, I could have. Oh, I wish I. Jesus was filled with compassion to the point where he looked at these crowds. And this is the word that Matthew used to describe the way he looked. It says he had compassion for them because they were harassed. The word harassed, the root word in the, in the Greek means to be flayed, to have your skin peeled off. That means a slow torture. That means every day is excruciating. That's the same thing. Another layer of skin is peeled off. Another day of ripping you apart. Another day. How many would love to, to get up every morning with that thought in your mind? That's another day of being harassed. Another day of the world stepping on me. Another day of the world stomping on me. Another day of being spit at. Another day of being laughed at. Another day of not having enough, of not this and not that. That's the word harassed. Is there's this constant thing that's always after you that you never have peace. There's never a day when you can say, oh, thank God it's Friday. The weekend's coming. There is no weekend for the harassed. There is no place of safety for the harassed. And he looked at these people. And many of them were Jews. Most of them were Jews. Some were God-fearing Greeks. Some were just people who were hearing the testimonies were coming to find out. Some were just broken Gentiles who needed the healing that God was providing through Jesus. But he looked at them. These were people who had religious teaching. They had the law, they had the Torah, they had the things that should have set them free. But there was a problem because at the top of this thing was an oppressive religious system that was denying access to the kingdom. Jesus said, you have the key to the kingdom and you've locked the door and you won't let anybody else in. So he looked at them as being harassed. So who was doing the harassing? Well, we could say the devil was doing it. Well, yeah, indirectly. But who was doing the harassing was the system of religion that locked people out of the freedom that God had promised. The systems that are set up to deny the power of God. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Now, we could think of what the works of the devil are, all the acts of the, the flesh that we think about. But really, what is the, the pinpoint of the work of the devil is to perpetrate lies. And lies to keep power, to keep yourself in a position of power. So Jesus was seeing this in real time. It says they were harassed and helpless. The word helpless there means thrown down and stepped on. Constantly stepped on. You make one step forward, you get kicked back two steps. These people were under the burden of the Roman Empire. They were under the burden of a religious system that wasn't working. And he felt compassion. He was compelled to do something. Paul said we are constrained by love. Another translation is we are compelled by love. When was the last time you felt compelled to do something? I mean really compelled that you couldn't not do it. Think about it. I, I, I thought when was the last time I felt truly compelled to do anything? I know the right thing to do. I know certain things I should do, but I can't remember, and shame on me, for not feeling the sense of being compelled. I can't not do this. I have to do this. And in my mind, I go through a thousand reasons why I don't have to, I shouldn't, it's not the right time, I can't, whatever. Jesus, for him, anytime somebody in front of him presented themselves with a need, he was compelled to do something. He was compelled to do something because he was totally selfless. 
I said, well, if I become totally selfless, who's going to take care of me? Good question. Seek first the kingdom of God, and then who takes care of us? The Father takes care of us. Who took care of Jesus? The Father. He said, Father, I know you always know. I know you always hear. So I'm going to do what you need me to do, and I'm going to trust that you're going to take care of me. Jesus was never needy. He was never needy. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, the phrase there, shall not want, does not mean you're not going to have any wants. It means you won't be in want. You'll lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd. Listen to what he says next. Because they were harassed, they were being filleted, their skin was being ripped off, they were being hard-pressed, they were being crushed down like sheep without a shepherd. And this is not a peaceful scene. This analogy, this, this word picture that Jesus was presenting was not little Bo Peep and her sheep walking through the field. This was not a serene place. If you read Psalm 23, it's a war zone. It's leading the, the sheep through a war zone. He's leading them to still waters. He's leading them beside to green pastures. And it's not this place where all you hear is a trickling water in the stream and the clouds and the butterflies and the flowers. That's the end game. But a shepherd leads his sheep to those places. But in order to get to those places, you have to go through the hard places. And a shepherd was a warrior. A shepherd was will someone who's willing to go into the mouth of a bear or a wolf and pull the sheep out of its mouth. Jesus said a hireling would never do that. Somebody who's a professional would think it was below them to do that. But somebody who has compassion understands what it means to be a shepherd. That those sheep were given to me and I must protect them at all costs. I mean, look at David as a teenager. He got the, the runt end of the deal, if you will. He had a bunch of older brothers that were probably tired of toting the sheep around. So when David was old enough, probably 13, 14 years old, he was the one who had to stay out there all night with the sheep. And when do lions and bears usually attack the sheep? At night. Well, who gets third shift? David. But what was he doing on third shift? Was he grumbling, complaining? Was he cursing his brothers out? He was perfecting his craft. He was perfecting his worship, and he was perfecting his craft as a king. Because if he was going to be king someday, he had to have a heart for the people he would rule over. He would have to look at the people in his kingdom and be willing to go into dangerous places to rescue them. They're like sheep without a shepherd. So what Jesus is saying is not just a commentary on culture. Boy, I tell you, we have a lot of people who love to comment on culture. What's wrong with this? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with this? But yet how many are actually putting down their microphones, talk about the ultimate mic drop, and going right in to the wolf's mouth? That's the good shepherd. And when Jesus sends us out as laborers into the harvest field, he's not sending us out there to sing kumbaya around a campfire. He's sending us out there to go into the wolf's den, into the place where the bear is, into the dark places where the problems are being magnified, into a system that we despise, into things that we don't want to participate in. That's where the good shepherd goes. Jesus used the analogy of the lost sheep. He'll leave the 99 sitting in Sunday morning service because they're being well fed and he's going to go look for the one that found him or herself in the mouth of a wolf or a bear. He's going to look for them. And what happens if he finds that little lamb who made mistakes, who made bad decisions, who willfully chose to do something stupid? So we have no excuses. It's not, well, that person chose that. Well, yeah, so what? We chose a lot of stupid things too. God is not a respecter of choices. He's a respecter of faith. And if somebody is crying out and he sends a shepherd in to go rescue them, he expects some rescuing to happen. 
When was the last time we were willing to really fight for somebody who was in the mouth of a wolf? Or we just throw up our hands and say, oh, well, I'm not getting involved in that one. They're bed. They made it. They can sleep in it. This is a high call, folks. This is ministry 101. He prepared his disciples for three plus years, not just to understand theology, not just to have arguments with people and win them, but to understand that to minister, the word ministry means service. That our call primarily is to serve the unservable, is to willingly do that. Compassion compels us. So we can have compassion without compromise. We can have mercy without having to worry about going mainstream. You don't have to be merciful and compassionate and water down the gospel. If somebody's in the mouth of a wolf, well, you know, I don't think the teeth are that bad. You know, I've seen wolf with worse teeth. I've seen bears with bigger claws. You know, let, let's talk about this. You know, the direction you're going is bad, but, you know, let's, let's meet halfway. There are religious mindsets that are trying to do that right now. They're trying to compromise instead of being compassionate. They think that by compromising and not bringing truth, they're doing people a favor. But you're watching the jaws of the wolf clamp down harder when you're not willing to say, you know, that choice you made is going to lead you right back into the mouth, mouth of the wolf. I'm not condemning you. I'm not criticizing you, but I'm getting into the mouth with you because I want you to know that Jesus does not want you to have to live like this. He doesn't want you to live in pain. He doesn't want you to be harassed. He doesn't want you to be helpless. He wants to get into your space and he wants to rescue you because he's a good shepherd. He doesn't just lead you into places of peace. He leads you through places of war. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That is a Hebrewism for if I walk through the places where darkness is ready to swallow me, when I have enemies all around me, that's the place where Jesus leads me. He doesn't go around. He goes through. He wants to bring us through. Though you walk through the waters, you'll not be overwhelmed. Though you are thrown in the furnace, you won't be burned. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't even smell like smoke. God wants to lead people through, but he's looking for shepherds. He's looking for shepherds. He's not talking about full-time pastors. He's looking for under-shepherds. And everybody in this room who proclaims Jesus as their Lord is an under-shepherd. Your call is the same. My call is the same. Now, it may look different every day. <clears throat> there may be different expressions of it. But ultimately, when Jesus taps him on the shoulder and says, there's somebody in the mouth of a wolf, and I need you to go rescue them. I need you to go at least give them an opportunity to be pulled out of the teeth. I don't know, that's messy business, Jesus. You know, isn't that the pastor's job? Isn't that what full-time ministry is about? Isn't that what, what Sonia's supposed to be doing? Yeah, she is doing it. They are doing it. But I need you to do it with them. Like sheep without a shepherd. That's what drove the compassion. Who were supposed to be the shepherds? The religious leaders. The prophets many times said, you have shepherdless shepherds. You have shepherds that are in it for their own glory, their own business, their own bottom line, whatever it is. And he criticized and condemned those shepherds. He called them out. But now he's looking for a new class of shepherds, people who live for them, not for themselves, but for the king. They love not their lives unto death. Now, every day is not a death march. Every day is not the saliva of the wolf dripping over you. Every day is not feeling the hot breath of a bear chasing you down. But there are days when it's going to feel like that if you're a good shepherd. There are days, <clears throat> got a frog in my throat. Yeah, a little water would help. <clears throat> Never mind. I'm going to share my wife's. better. <clears throat> but there are days when you're going to ask yourself, is this really worth it? Is this really worth it? 
Every time I go to rescue, I get rejected. Every time I pour, bottom falls out, it leaks out. You know, I minister to people with holes in the bucket all the time. At what point do I stop pouring in? As long as I'm on this planet. There's no period or comma, it's a sentence. Go into all the world, make disciples. Just do it. There's only one time in scripture when the disciples asked Jesus to increase their faith. I mean, they saw the miracles. They saw the things Jesus did. And there's only one recorded time in all the Gospels when they actually asked Jesus to increase their faith. And that was in reference to ministry to other people. How to love other people. How to love the unlovable. Bless those who persecute you. Do not repay evil with evil, but repay it with good. The only time, and then when Jesus answered the question that said, Lord, increase our faith, how are we supposed to forgive 70 times 70? How in the world are we supposed to keep getting rejected, keep getting spit at, keep getting lied about, keep getting slandered? How many times have we got to keep doing this? Seven times? Well, up the Pharisees. Three strikes, you're out rule. Seven times? And Jesus magnified, the word seven is completion. And he magnified it because we could say seven times would be completion for us, but seven times 70 is completion for God. In other words, do you want God to stop forgiving you? Do you want God to stop receiving you when you've blown it? Well, no. Then you have no reason to stop for somebody else. And then they say, Lord, increase our faith. And you know what his response was? He gave a little parable. He said, let me ask you a question. If you have hired hands, if you have servants, not slaves, but servants, hired hands, that are working in the field, they work in the field, they come home, and part of their responsibility is to make sure that you and your family are fed if you're the the owner. They feed you the meal, and then they eat. Jesus said, do you think that would be strange? They said, no. They said, well, that's what I'm asking you to do. You're just doing what I ask you to do. You're just doing what I need you to do. You need to continue to serve even when you're rejected. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The Son of Man also came to serve the lost. We saw last week that word healing. Jesus healed all these diseases. And from Acts chapter 4, the prayer of the disciples was this. Lord, we'll continue to be bold. We'll speak boldly. And the word boldly there means clearly and frankly. Not bold in the sense where you yell and scream and are confident as a person. I mean, some people are bold because that's who they are. But the word boldness there is I'm not afraid to speak frankly and openly. This is the original Second Amendment. Freedom of speech. It's not only freedom of speech, it's a requirement for believers to speak freely to not be afraid of offending. Now, I don't want to offend because I want to offend somebody, but I'm not afraid to speak truth if it's going to heal somebody, if it's going to bring release or freedom. And we are being clamped down in our culture right now. We're being told what we can and cannot say, how we can say it, how we shouldn't say it, and what happens if we do choose to say it. Now again, we're not looking to be obstinate and antagonistic just because we want to. But we have to realize that when Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the word preach there means publicize or publish it. Make it clear, make it plain. Don't become the false media who says one thing and does another thing. Talk plainly, tell people the truth. Speak it, be clear, be bold. But we have to understand that not everybody's going to want to hear it. Not everybody's going to accept it. Not everybody's going to believe it. But that doesn't change the message. So the disciples said, here's the partnership. We'll be bold. We'll say what you've told us to say. We'll stand for what you've told us to stand. You extend your hand through us to bring healing. And last week we left off with this thought, the word heal there. And Jesus commanded his disciples as shepherds to heal the sick to heal them. But what is that word healed 
in the broad sense. It's the word therapuo or therapeutic. And the root word means to wait on tables. It was a word for a servant who waited on tables, a therapuo. In other words, you went to the kitchen, you got the meal, and you brought it to the person who's supposed to eat it. When Jesus said heal the sick, all he's asking us to do is to act on the compassion of God and bring the healing of heaven into that person's life. I am not the chef in the kitchen. I am not the manufacturer of the healing. I am the servant who delivers it in the name of Jesus. And that healing is not just physical, it's mental, it's emotional, it's financial, it's addiction, it's every under, everything under the sun. Jesus healed every kind of disease, every kind of ailment. So no matter what name we give it in our, our culture right now, Jesus heals it. He's the one who has the antidote for the poison. We are the ones who deliver it as the therapist. That takes the responsibility off me. I don't have to manufacture the healing. I just need to act in compassion. When somebody is sharing their story, I need to be listening and saying, Father, is this a moment to act? Is this a moment to do something? And the testimony angel shared, those people went out with a mission. They're in school, they're being trained, but how many of you know training can only be proved when you go and do it? That's why Jesus said, go. You've been with me for three years, watching, hearing, experiencing. Now you need to do it. You need to go because you don't know if you know unless you go and you do what you think you know. So they had to go. And if you read the Gospels, it says they came back after those initial sendings and they were amazed at what happened because they were simply being obedient instead of trying to figure it out. Instead of getting stuck on when it didn't happen. How many have times when you got stuck because it didn't happen the last 20 times you tried? The last 100 times you prayed? People are dying. People are broken. People are not getting free. People are addicted. It's not working. Jesus didn't ask us to analyze it. He just said, come to the kitchen, pick up your plate, and deliver it to the person. That's boldness. Someone says they're broken, Jesus can heal you. That's boldness. Do you want me to pray? That's when I go to the kitchen and I pick up the plate of whatever it is. The receiver has the responsibility to eat the food. So where's my responsibility? Not to heal the person, not to make them eat, but to be obedient and be bold. Not to water it down, not to back down, not to compromise it, not to mainstream it, but just to be honest. Say, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not trying to prove anything to you. I'm just presenting something to you. Proof is impossible. Because the word proof is different than evidence. We have tons of evidence that what we're believing in is true. If anybody wants to look at evidence, how many of you know that our justice system refuses to look at evidence most of the time? <laughs> not admissible. So evidence... We have tons of evidence. This book is filled with evidence. History is filled with evidence. Testimonies are filled with evidence. If you want evidence, it's all over the place. Evidence is evident. But the one thing we don't have is proof. Because proof by its very definition means it has to be this and it can't, it can't ever be that. And there's no way I'm going to prove to somebody that what I'm telling them is absolutely true unless they experience it. That's not my responsibility. I can't prove anything to anybody. If someone says, I'll believe if you prove it. Here, taste it. Let God prove it himself. I can't prove it. Then it's up to God. I will serve the meal, God, but if this meal is the antidote for their poison, you extend your hand through me to do it. And I really believe, and I said this a couple weeks ago, that there's a resending happening in the church. We understand the Great Commission to the point where we have just ignored it because we look at it as our, our team in Guatemala instead of the homeless encampment or instead of our school systems, instead of our local governments, instead of our businesses. We need to look at the commission through different eyes. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out, to dropkick us into those places.
And God's pretty accurate with his punts. He can place it anywhere on the field he wants and as far as he needs it to go. But I need to be willing to be in the master's hand, knowing that as the master moves, there's a kick coming. And he drops me and bam, that's being sent out. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out. And this prayer was not directed to other people. It was directed to his disciples. You pray to the Lord of the harvest to send you out. And if you read Matthew 9, the very last part of that, guess what happens in Matthew chapter 10? And Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority and sent them out. So be careful what you pray for, be careful what you ask for, because the next morning you're probably going to get an opportunity. So there's a resending happening, and God is doing it in a local place, right here, right now. And we're going to see a harvest to the degree that we are harvesting that we are going into those places where people need to hear good news, experience good news, and encounter Jesus. Regardless of what label we put on it, if they're in the mouth of a wolf, if they're in the claws of a bear, that's what good shepherds do. So how many good shepherds are among us? Whew. Dangerous prayers. But that's what God's looking for. And I believe that God has put that on us in this body, in this season, to relook at this and to make sure that every one of us is being compelled in some way to act with compassion. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you stand and seal this in prayer? Well, Father, we're not condemned in any way, but Lord, we certainly want to be convicted. Father, we're not going to let shame motivate us because shame is a tool of the enemy. We thank you that there is no shame in Christ. There's no condemnation in Christ. But there is motivation. And I'm asking, Lord, for all of us here who desire it is to have a fresh encounter with compassion not just feeling, but being compelled to do. Lord, we certainly can't possibly do everything that comes across our path, but we are a body of believers. And there's somebody in the body to be responsible to respond to the needs that are presented. And Father, we have to believe that you planted Elevate Church and other churches in this area, not just to be churches of Christian religion, but to be headquarters of kingdom business that we are the kingdom depot where all that is needed is given to the church and supplied to the community. Every problem has a kingdom answer. So Father, we're asking again, we're re-upping again. Lord, we're asking you to stir us again, to make us uncomfortable again if we have become apathetic, if we relied on sympathy and empathy and still have become apathetic Father we're asking in this season especially with the spring and summer when people are moving around there's so many more opportunities let us not miss these windows so Father I thank you for what you start you intend to finish and there's going to be a great response in the heart of the people in this place in Jesus name if you need prayer this morning for something that we haven't touched yet, if you have need of healing in your body, a breakthrough, if you're going through something, anything that you're carrying, you need somebody to agree with you in prayer, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come on up here. Come on up and have somebody pray with you, over you, for you. If not, be compelled this week to do something with compassion. Amen? And today, first Sunday of the month, we have birthdays and celebrations, so we have cake and cupcakes over to my right and your left. Have an awesome day.